All right. Um, so I think people are probably still filing in, but um, quick call out as we as we start this off. I know that the the picture on the the advertisement is a little bit different. Joe Sullivan actually um, has COVID right now and is unable to uh, to make it to this. And so uh, Warren and myself, I'm Sean Hall. I'm an associate director here. We're going to be running this in in place uh, of Joe. So uh, welcome everybody. Excited to to kick this off and run through things. Um, I can give a quick kind of a 30 second introduction on myself. I do a lot of crypto work here at the firm as well. In addition to Joe, I'd say that Joe probably focuses more on the consumer side, whereas my team uh, down here in Florida uh, does a lot of our B2B search work here at Diversa. Uh, I've been here about six years, a little over six years at this point. Like I said, we've always been uh, a B2B focused team, but um, now I had say in the past, two and a half years or so, at least professionally speaking, we've been focused a lot more on our crypto sector. Um, personally, outside of Diversa, uh, I think I've probably been involved with crypto for uh, at least five and a half years. So I wouldn't say I'm necessarily like a super early adopter, but I got in uh, early enough to be able to, um, you know, to, to kind of fall in love with the space. And so that now that's bled into my, uh, my career as well. And so um, what we're going to do today is touch on a bunch of different topics. We're going to go through, uh, obviously, the rapidly expanding Web3 ecosystem. I want to talk through, uh, essentially, what we're seeing from a talent perspective, compensation, equity and tokens, kind of all that interesting stuff. Uh, and then we're going to reserve the last 15 minutes or so for kind of just a general Q&A section to, to go over things. Um, so, so Warren, uh, I want to hand over to you quickly to kind of give you know a quick debrief on uh, on your background, and then we can jump into some of the uh, the stuff that everybody actually came here for in the crypto world. Awesome, thanks, Sean. And you know, first and foremost, thank you to Versa Partners and Hunt Steelen for having us today. Um, my name is Warren Lorenz, founding uh, founder and managing partner here at TechMeets Trader. Uh, TechMeets Trader, we have three different business units, all surrounded within the blockchain, Web three, crypto world, if you will. Um, we started a business in 2015 and didn't necessarily transition full time until 2017 into crypto, if you will. But um, our, our, we started with consulting as our primary focus, which allowed us to work with, you know, exchanges and hedge funds and NFT projects, launch DAOs, you know, do white papers, token launches, you know, kind of the gambit through that experience. And over the years, that allowed us to kind of transition into our, our kind of core focus um, today. And we're, that's our family of funds. We have two funds. We have a venture fund and a, a market neutral arbitrage and lending hedge fund. Um, and, you know, that's where as a business where we're really kind of scaling and, you know, but nonetheless, we've, we've kind of been in throughout the industry and touched on it all. So I'm excited to talk, you know, with you, Sean, about everything, you know, you know as everything is in the, in the crypto space, extremely volatile right now. And uh, it's been an interesting past couple of days. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and that's a good, it's a good segue, Warren. We, we have an agenda that we want to, to go through, um, but I feel like we, we have to talk through the last few days uh, with all the volatility, not just in the crypto space, but, you know, on a broader traditional financial um, perspective as well. So like, I'm, I'm really curious just from my own, um, you know, volition, what, what are your, what's your take on the past few days? What's going on? I know we saw some some stable coins get depegged. Obviously, we've seen some some huge price fluctuations, and so um, you know, what's your perspective on it over it? Uh, over yeah, now? you know, it's uh, as you as you said, it's been a volatile last you know few days here in crypto, and we're really starting to see. Uh, I mean, personally, in my opinion, what will be remembered as a very historic event for the industry. You know, a top ten stable coin, and for those who are in the audience and perhaps don't have any presumption of this space, you know, stable coins are, you know, if, if you go to the US, you know, if you go to your bank and you go to withdraw dollars, that dollar should be worth one, right? It's the denominator of most quoting currencies, a dollar is worth one. Well, a stable coin is typically an asset that is, you know, um, priced at one and is pegged at one so that people can efficiently transact within the eco within the crypto ecosystem. And really what's unfolded over the last 72 hours that's caused this kind of system, systemic risk that we're seeing and sell off and, and whatnot um, is, is traditional firms and financial firms, hedge funds, um, trading firms, kind of, uh, had a consortium that had a targeted attack on a specific stable coin. 
you know, this asset was trading, let's call it at a dollar. And a lot of people had this in their savings. It was a $20 billion market cap stable coin. Um, and it had a, a, another asset that worked alongside it, um, which was also in, in terms of par value around the same market cap. So in total around $40 billion nearly wiped out over the last, let's call it three days within this one targeted attack coming into this ecosystem. Now, this is kind of one of the first large scale um, instances in the industry, if you will, of traditional hedge funds, you know, who are, who are typically within their own domicile coming into the industry and not trying to take a um, approach of let's build together and, and be constructive as opposed to the, the alternative, which is more so destructive. Right. And so the aftermath is, is kind of what you're seeing is systemic selling. Um, that's caused, you know, liquidations in terms of the DeFi markets. DeFi stands for decentralized finance, for those who are unaware. Um, and, and in that, you know, ecosystem, it's very common for you to take assets such as stable coins or Bitcoin or Ethereum, and you, it's called collateralizing it. You deposit it into some smart contract and you can borrow against that. So if you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and you said, hey, I need like $200,000, you could go in, deposit your Bitcoin, pull out $200,000. You have an 80 you know, percent uh, health ratio on that loan and you know, you're fairly well protected. Now, when stable coins depeg in this nature, obviously that collateral starts being liquidated and cascading through the entire industry. So what you're seeing here is this entire kind of risk off systemic sale coming from this one specific targeted attack. Um, and that's kind of where our, my head's been with the market neutral arbitrage and lending fund that we have here at TechMeets Trader, because of course, as market makers and arbitrageurs, you know, it's our, it's our responsibility to help step in and make markets and, and do that to the best of our ability. So it's been a, uh, a wild day at the trading desk for the last three days. If you I, will. I'm sure. And, and I know that, you know, a lot of people were kind of propping up Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation, and this has kind of you know, thrown that for a loop as well. And so I think, you know, I guess one thing quickly, uh, because we do want to have this uh, and tie this back into some Q&A is if you do have any questions through this uh, to the broader group, there is a Q&A section on the bottom right next to the uh, raise hand button. And so please feel free to to chime in and we'll, we'll get to those in the end. But but to your point, Warren, I think um, from where from where we stand right at Diversa, obviously, the way that we evaluate companies is based on their talent, right? And, and, you know, I'm not a super technical guy. I like to think that I'm, um, you know, up to date on the crypto space, but the way that I really can tell if a company you know, is, is doing well or is set up for success is, is based on talent evaluation. And so now that we're seeing so much volatility um, across the space, not just in the crypto world, but also within traditional finance as well, what we're seeing is not just price volatility, but actually candidate volatility. Um, as well. And so really, it's a good thing, you know, as this space matures, and as these companies go through their ups and downs, we're able to, uh, you know, to get access to more candidates now that they're thinking about what might be next. Um, and so I think like, you know, taking it a step forward, I'm super curious in terms of your situation and your perspective as a market maker, um, like what kinds of newer technologies are you looking at? I know, like, obviously, we've, you know, been in sort of this, you um, this web 2.5 slash web three um, sort of filler space right now. And there's obviously the huge payments landscape as well, but now that that's getting crushed, are there any sort of newer technologies or, um, or areas and segments that you guys are excited about over there at Technic Trader? Definitely. And I would kind of zoom out of the arbitrage and lending fund and go more towards the venture side and kind of what we've seen across the broader market in terms of, you know, opportunity and excitement. And, right. you know, we were very early supporters of uh, industry called play to earn. Um, you know, we were seed investors into a company that didn't even, that coined the name, but didn't even exist, you know, at, at the time, the concept of playing based NFT games in order to make capital was there, but it wasn't coined play to earn or anything like that back in 2018, 2019, when we first started getting into that space. And so as that space has started to evolve, you know, um, we're seeing some really, really interesting partnerships come in from the play to earn side from traditional firms, you know, such as, um, let's call it audio and record label firms, you have uh, historic 
um, animation firms that firms that have done video games and kids. Activision is doing it. Yeah, totally. Right. And things right. of that nature. And, and, um, and so it's, it's very, very exciting. I think from an innovation perspective to actually, because you, you look at the millennial generation, which is kind of a core demographic within this crypto sphere okay. in terms of the users, right? And uh, in the time with COVID and spending behind screens and that's kind of pushing back into that video game system has been, has been a huge, um, a hugely attractive industry. Outside of that, I think is extraordinarily interesting is what we're seeing from the tracking of on-train tools and the, and the overall blockchain ecosystem tooling. Um, you know, there's tools that are commonplace now, but when we first got get going, really, it wasn't commonplace to integrate like a chain analysis in terms of right. transaction monitoring, um, right? And there's other transaction monitoring softwares too, but that one's kind of the most well-known well name, you know, within the industry. Um, and that's, you know, protected hundreds of people from malicious attacks or projects rather from malicious attacks collaborated across different jurisdictions and governments. And so when I start looking at all of the touch points within, you know, not just the crypto ecosystem, but the real world, I think those types of um, innovations that are within the industry that are kind of showing that we want to operate responsibly, you know, within re reasonable regulatory environments, those types of things are, are very exciting. And then, of course, we would be um, we, we would be it would be irresponsible to overlook the the DeFi component, right? The decentralized finance wave that we're seeing. Um, you know, with the market volatility in this one instance with this one stable coin, it's I think a good snapshot of obviously the risks and what can happen. Um, but nonetheless, as a whole, the ecosystem remains solvent, healthy, and, and moving forward. And, um, and when you start looking at the innovations between not just the financial products between, you know, perpetual future contracts, which isn't tr traditional in, um, in nature. And you start looking at like financial NFTs, like vesting, staking NFTs and ways as, you know, people in DAOs are receiving financial NFTs as compensation. And we're going to get on, well, we're going to get to that uh, in the future, you know, in this conversation. So I, I hate to foreshadow too, too much, but <laughs> I think those types of toolings, the voting in terms of governance structures and all the above um, really make me excited about kind of the longevity of the space, right? Because we see on the institutional aspect that the, the access to capital coming into the ecosystem is ever present, right? It's capital is cheap within this um, world at, the, at, you know, at this time relative to other markets, right? Um, and, uh, and so like, that's just fueling perpetual building and growth and, and innovation. And, and sometimes you're going to have instances like you're seeing over the last three days where people come in and try to break things, things are going to break. That's if you're, if you're trying to innovate and things haven't broken once along the way, you're probably not doing a good job of pushing yourself, <laughs> you know? And so like, it's all a due course and, and, uh, but nonetheless, it's all very exciting from that perspective. I agree. And, and and I'm glad that you mentioned some of the things, um, you know, outside of the financial landscape too, because I think what we're seeing, you know, across our, across our client spectrum is kind of this decoupling, you know, in, in crypto that's, yes, you have your payments companies and yes, you have your, you know, your DeFi companies and TradFi companies, but you also got companies that are focused on, you know, experiences, right? Like ticketing uh, NFT applications. And then you've got companies that are focused on cloud storage and like where we're seeing, I'd say a majority of our, our actual work um, and like, you know, we're working with, with great companies like Chainalysis, as you mentioned, and Gemini and OpenSea, but we're also working with the startup layer too that are uh, the earlier stage cloud storage companies, right? In the earlier stage, more like developer focused and developer tool focused companies. And so I think that this decoupling away from, you know, crypto in the context of finance is really interesting. And we're seeing a ton of development uh, across the spectrum where people are applying, you know, blockchain technology or um, essentially just, you know, any sort of developer focused technology that's using, whether it's Ethereum or Solana, um, you know, or Avalanche, where we just did a bunch of search work as well. Um, let's have the A16Z portfolio with Chris Dixon. Um, is this focus on, you know, this next generation of, of development and application uh, use cases, as opposed to, you know, just trying to reinvent the exchange landscape where Coinbase has seen so much success and Binance has seen so much success. Um, and so you mentioned something else too, that I wanted to to probe on a little bit in terms of capital being cheap right now. And so 
I think one of the things that we've seen that's been really interesting and also kind of difficult to wrap our heads around just from a candidate compensation standpoint, as well as a, a, a company funding standpoint is like, how are these companies going about actually raising, you know, these funds where, um, where, how, how are they getting finance? Where are they finding, you know, these investors and how is the process that, um, that you guys are seeing? How's that playing out? Yeah. And I think even before we go specific into the mechanics of the, the deal, if you will, on the financing side, mm -hmm. It might make sense to take a step back and talk about the two different types of structures as a whole from a corporate structuring perspective that kind of have two different divergent paths. Um, as you kind of have alluded to, there's kind of the centralized based entities that are very commonplace, you know, the grayscales, the bitwise, the coinbase, the open seas, right? Household hold names that, but more or less are within a specific centralized organization, right? Those compensation structures differ rather drastically than what we're seeing in more of the decentralized organization structures, the DAOs, if you will. Um, and so I think maybe we'll touch on, we'll definitely touch on both, but let's talk on the more traditional side first and then transition into the more exotic um, decentralized, you know, autonomous organization. So in, in regards to the overall funding mechanisms for traditional firms, it's definitely uh, to early stage equity round, the venture capital funded growth early on, right, that we've seen historically. Um, that is where new talent that's coming in is, is sometimes getting restricted stock units, but, you know, more commonplace, what we're starting to see with those types of equity vesting agreements is a, a, a warrant, if you will, and by nature, right? And so that's not to say, hey, we have a token that's listed, but in the instance of like a a Ethereum name service, right? That has a huge um, centralized component, but then wanted to, you know, obviously airdrop to their communities and things like that. In the future, if there were to become a token, these new talent, you know, hires are, are taking um, warrants on a potential token at a certain percentage of supply um, because tokenomics, you know, haven't kind of come out at that point. And so you're going to start looking at, it'd be hard to say you're going to get 10,000 tokens at, you know, $10, if you will, when you don't know if there ever even will be a token, right? And so that's kind of a slight change in the traditional venture structure that we're seeing, at least from the early stage deals. Now, in the later st stage deals, as you start getting closer to the Series B, the mezzanine round, you know, IPO or SPAC route, whatever it may be in terms of, you know, your, your, um, public offering or exit or whatever that entails is there's been a lot of SPACs that have been, you know, coming into the market um, to acquire, you know, these types of companies and kind of replace management, um, you know, because you can take it from zero to, in some instances, you may be taking it from zero to 500 million in revenue within a short period of time, three or four years. Right, but as they start wanting to underwrite, hey, we have this token ecosystem that's going on, which typically is segregated, right? In some instances that are now coming in, in public via SPAC, there's a token component, there's the equity component, kind of and then you're looking at, right? And then you're looking at the balance sheet component, right? And so there's like a lot to digest. And so from a talent perspective, it's up until that point, it's very, um, a lot is negotiated, right, between restricted stock units, cash as compensation, as well as, you know, a warrant-like structure. I think that differs from the decentralized component, you know, the DAO uh, component, if you will, where there really isn't a centralized entity, a corporate structure that's typically responsible for the, the collective as a group. Right. And, and so hiring in that type of environment is extremely difficult because, a lot of DAOs will come up and launch and be like, hey, we're just going to recruit talent within the organization. But ones that are larger, um, for example, like a sushi, right, that recently had, um, you know, some, some tumultuous times, but nonetheless is still weathered through with their core management team. Nonetheless, they have, you know, huge treasuries, ability to navigate. And so those types of folks are recruiting really impact players, right, to, to kind of bootstrap and grow to that next level. Yeah. Um, and so what does that look like and from a compensation perspective when you've already launched, there's a fair market value and the like, right? Um, that's different than if you're doing pre-launch. Um, pre-launch is typically very similar to if you're getting into an early stage venture in, in the traditional structure, where instead of equity, though, for these types of decentralized autonomous organizations, it's a governance token. So these 
these entities, the way that they operate is through uh, typically and, uh, two assets. One that's an asset within the ecosystem that's used within whatever product or service that may be delivered. And then the second component is like a voting uh, asset that's utilized for the collective as a whole to kind of coordinate specific uh, initiatives on behalf of the organization. And, and so when you're getting obviously rights in the governance of that entity by receiving that as a form of compensation. And then of course, down the line, as you've launched and you know you have to retain key employees as well. One of the key, uh, key issues with some of these types of structures is they've done very, very well, their assets become liquid, you know, and then you have individuals who have perhaps five to 10 X their personal net worth. And then perhaps some of their desires as individuals to keep innovating and, and build forward slightly changes with the, with, you know, their change in life, if you will. So you're yeah. starting to see those types of individuals become very successful and then fade out. And then obviously the ones who are ultra successful, but then just that is not a core motivator for them. There's not an end game and they're just powering forward and, and developing. I think the perfect example for that is, you know, uh, Sam Bankman Frieda FTX, right, is one yeah. of those individuals who doesn't need to show up to work. I mean, he's, I think, one of the top 10 now most uh, wealthiest individuals, right, in, in the world. But nonetheless, that guy is sleeping in beanbag chairs in the office, right? He's just <laughs> built different. Um, and, and so, you know, from a compensation perspective, from an early stage, you're looking at governance and then, you know, perhaps vesting in the ecosystem token as well. Cash as compensation is very difficult because typically the cash that's being utilized early on is, um, is for the treasury like services. So it's for, you know, bootstrapping liquidity pools. Um, a lot of marketing and, and expense goes into, you know, user acquisition from that perspective. And then obviously development and legal. Right. Um, what remains, of course, is, is, you know, obviously like any organization tough, but the difference is a lot of the, these platforms don't have sustainable revenue drivers to keep giving that spigot. So cash is the ultimate commodity where, you know, tokens and, and the like are, are cheap. Um, I, think, I think you could even break it down even further. I think liquidity is the ultimate commodity because we spent a lot of time on this just in negotiating, you know, offers with candidates, right? And obviously, your base and your bonus are important in your salary. But the difference that we're seeing when we're negotiating a token uh, compensation package in comparison to an equity or a stock option plan is that you're liquid immediately, uh, unless you're pre-launch, of course, which you mentioned. But um, the utility that you get from that token plan is actually uh, much more viable immediately than your stock option plan. You're not, uh, you're not liable to go and actually purchase those options once your four-year vesting schedule is up, right? You're, you're able to essentially just receive those tokens and then the secondary market already exists for it, but it's being treated like the public markets are treating public companies. And so your token, based on your direct impact, if you're you know, a CMO, which for instance, we just did a, a CMO search for a company called Vela Labs, which the, was founded by Mike Kennedy, the founder of Zelle. Uh, he moved into focusing on cross-border payments. We brought on a, a CMO for him, this guy, Mark Fisher, who came out of, uh, out of PayPal. So knew the payment space, didn't necessarily know the crypto space as well, but his tokens were immediately liquid, right? And he's got kids that, you know, are going to college. And yeah, he wants to go for that long-term equity, which, which he will, right? And, um, and because he was able to, uh, I think, look at the tokens in terms of their immediate value, as opposed to the potential stock options uh, down the line for a, you know, for a 25-person company, that was able to give him some, uh, some peace of mind to jump into something early stage like this. And so that utility piece and that liquidity piece, I think, is what we found to be most important in negotiating these offers with these candidates who, you know, in, in, in more instances than one, because this market is so crazy right now, from a candidate standpoint, it's been really helpful because most candidates, if they are active, if they are looking for a role, they've got two or three or four, even four different offers in hand if they're, if they're a strong candidate. And you need to be able to make sure that you can really paint the picture around what's this long-term value look like for you and also um, how are you hedging your risk? Um, right. And, and I, I think, think like, the, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, but no, I was going to say that aligns very well with what I'm seeing in terms of kind of value driven personas, right? In, in the matching of the true like value systems, your, in, your internal value systems of, of as, you, as a core, what do you believe? Like for a, there's a huge audience of folks that are very passionate about having a decentralized store of value and they call it Bitcoin. Right. And so like, that's a huge value system for many. So then 
on, on those tenants, then they start working kind of tangentially, right? And so I think it's a matching of the values, knowing that it's going to likely be a, um, an uncertain ride. And for some types of companies, tokens is the primary form of compensation right. for work efforts, right? And that is a huge you know, shift, um, at least from what I'm seeing. Now, what are you seeing from, uh, from that perspective? Are you seeing still, obviously, I would expect the majority clientele to be centralized, but have you yet to start to see any of that decentralized um, clientele yet? Yeah. So two things. I know that there's a bunch of companies that are implementing sort of a hybrid model around how they're compensating you know, employees, whether it's uh, both equity and tokens, or if they're just straight up paying employees. You know, in Bitcoin, I know, I know Kraken pays about 80% of their paycheck in Bitcoin. I know BitPay, which is down in Atlanta, um, also does that. And that's more of like a, like a Shopify for crypto um, on the e-commerce side. But then, yeah, in terms of the decentralized aspect, there are a bunch of companies that um, that we're seeing that are, are, I think, pushing to go as decentralized as possible while still retaining as much of their ownership and voting rights as they can. Because the hard part is really deciding, you know, what your board makeup is. And if you've got an entirely, you know, decentralized autonomous organization, which everyone is calling a DAO uh, for context, it really can become pretty difficult to make important business decisions when the voters are really made up of just, you know, the entire community, right? So a lot of companies are kind of pushing a hybrid model for that right now, if they're if they're really focused on you know long-term profitability. Um, and, and then the second thing is there are some companies that I think are are focused on shifting more decentralized over time, right? And they're starting off to get off the ground in terms of you know the initial funding and they're going through the token drops and they're raising from the community, but they're retaining their board. Like, we did a we did a, a CEO search for a company called Storage Labs. We brought in Ben Golub, who is the CEO of Docker. He stepped in, and if anybody watches Silicon Valley on HBO or watched, Storage is actually pretty similar to Pied Piper from that show in terms of they they're basically like a, a file compression platform. It's an Airbnb for your data, where you can lease out your extra storage space, and it's going to decentralize all of your uh, your files and then spread them out over the community, and then pay the users. Um, in, in essentially Ethereum-based tokens. So longer term, they are focusing on basically implementing an entirely decentralized platform where the, the profitability is made up through the user base. But right now, as they're getting off the ground, they're bringing in you know, um, software operators to be able to set up the, the systems and the infrastructures that they're gonna need to be able to essentially go hands-off uh, in the future, right? Yep. So we brought in a CMO, uh, Rosie Pongrax out of IBM. She was working with IBM Watson and, uh, on a, and focused on all their blockchain initiatives. And she's kind of come in to help them, I would say, separate themselves as they go after like AWS in terms of the, uh, the infrastructure side. So, so yes, yeah, like what, to your question, what we're seeing are companies now, as we're kind of in like the web 2.5 phase, start off with a centralized, um, you know, segmentation of their product or of their of their executive team with the intentions of longer term moving into a decentralized aspect. And then we're also seeing, I think, um, in sort of like the, the more frontier aspect, folks that are starting off truly decentralized. I just think that the system and the 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 network and the talent, you know, landscape is not quite ready for that uh, from a recruiting standpoint entirely. So what we're having to do is sort of straddle that out of that line uh, as we as we work with candidates and kind of saying, hey, look, like you either need to throw everything out the out the window of what you've learned from you know recruiting and hiring um, and decision making and and jump into something that you don't necessarily you know know too much about or hasn't been proven yet, um, or you can sort of ease your way in with one of these companies that's kind of shifting in. But I mean, I don't know the right answer to it yet. I don't think anybody does, right. which is definitely you know it's definitely uh, something that we're focused on here like at the firm, right? As we work with all these different companies, um, what we're trying to do is kind of pick out the ones that are exciting, focus on them, work with them really closely so that we can get a, a really hands-on perspective on what works, what doesn't work, right? right? And so from a talent perspective, there's kind of two buckets that we're saying to every crypto company that we're working with. In every, in every pitch that I go on, in every meeting that I, that I go on, it's, it's, it's two things, right? You can go from the proven crypto landscape and you can find somebody that you know understands the crypto space and has seen success in the crypto space, but the reality is that bucket of, of that candidate pool 
is very small, right? You find yourself recruiting out of 15, 20, 25 companies that are specific to the space, wherever you're, you're focused on, like, you know, you're working on a, a new exchange, you're going to be recruiting out of Kraken and Coinbase and Binance, yeah. uh, which are great companies, but there's less of them. Whereas if you're scaling at a breakneck pace, right, and you're a hyper growth company, the other opportunity or the other perspective is let's bring somebody in that understands hyper growth and let's bring somebody right. in that understands how to build and scale at a hyper growth pace. And then they can learn the crypto side of the, of the, uh, of the company, right. which the reality is a lot of people to these days that are in sort of like these, you know, these hyper growth companies are at least tangentially aware of the crypto world and they can pick that up. And then no, it's no. different across, you know, functionality. If you're an engineer, it's a very different um, ramp up time than if you're a marketer, right? And, and that's something that we're cognizant of as well as we, as we run through these recruiting um, cycles. But I do think that what we're finding is a lot more success today. And this will obviously change as this space develops, but today finding someone who understands how to scale and how to grow and can put in place the scalable infrastructure for a company um, as opposed to sp specifically recruiting out of the crypto space. And I'm excited for that to, you know, to, to keep transitioning over time. And it's definitely, we're seeing it in real time happen, but as a, you know, as a search consultant to these companies, we have to be honest with them about giving yourself the best ch chance for, you know, for hiring success. And a lot of times that, that means going after somebody who, um, who may not be from the crypto world. I think, yeah. You mentioned a chain analysis before. We placed W. Thomas Stanley. He was the zero at Tanium. Uh, he, stepped, he stepped into chain analysis and they just raised a monster round uh, yesterday, right? So, and there, I think you were saying earlier that they're still undervalued. I mean, stuff like that and those success stories are what I think we're really hanging our hat on uh, in terms of that perspective and how we're approaching the market. You know, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, I think there's two things as well that if I were sitting in your seat, I would be holding on to my chair, you know, holding on tight is a managing expectations. Um, and so I want to kind of hear from you as well as, as like your thought process of, you know, when you start dealing with executive searches and whatnot, you know, of course, there's a whole diaspora of, of egos, right? And not only from historical success, perhaps in different industries, but probably from a compensation component as well. So how have you guys as a kind of firm helped try to manage expectations? Because everyone who's coming into crypto expects, all right, in 12 months, I'm going to be yeah. very, very wealthy, you know, and it's like a get rich quick scheme. But the reality is, is it's pretty much only the builders who are developing through bear markets that kind of see the fruits of their labors when things are going well, you totally. know, so how are you, how are you managing expectations? Well, so I, I actually think that the answer to that is the same answer that I would give for someone that's non-crypto, right? Like the way that we evaluate companies, and honestly, I think that the, the best way to evaluate companies, because anybody can put, um, you know, a pretty deck together, it's talent and it's the team and it's the people that make up uh, that company. And I don't think it's any different for, for evaluating a crypto company, right? Like it, you still have the same risk, maybe not as volatile, but you do have risks joining a startup that's going to offer you a typical stock option plan, right? Uh, it can go to zero. I think we saw it with uh, with Fast, right? Like Stripe came in, they had the best backers in the world, but the team just was overspending and they weren't necessarily, you know, structured the right way. So I think if you put an emphasis around the team building um, first and foremost and, and prioritize that, that's the only way that you can really evaluate a company's potential for success. Yeah. Um, and I think that that applies as well for crypto companies. And I think that's where we can be really successful not only just as you know a recruiting firm, but also as we're starting to do our own investments as well, and I'm sure you're seeing it at um, uh, with you guys as well, is making sure that you know you're doing the due diligence on the team and not just necessarily like the product, because the, the idea I think can be great, but if you're not surrounding it with the right people, um, it's not going to work. And so if you can if you can tell the story around why this team makes sense for it to be successful, that's how we're advising candidates to um, you know to take that risk. Yep. No, that makes that makes complete sense. And, uh, you know, at least from some of the profiles, public companies that we work with as well, that do some, you know, recruiting at, at that level as well. You know, some of the feedback that they've received is actually there's been like a huge willingness actually to be working um, kind of in cahoots with um, in alignment rather uh, right. with the firm as to structures that make sense to based off milestones and performance like any other industry, right? But in crypto, the KPIs are a little bit less subjective and more on-chain and analytical. 
Right. Um, so it's a little bit, a little bit more clear from that perspective, which can be helpful or, you know, it can go the complete opposite way. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel like, I feel like I've been name dropping this whole time. So I I'm super curious, like what companies you're excited about, like, you know, who are you, who are you, uh, following pretty closely these days? Yeah. Um, throughout the entire industry, you know, we, we kind of follow different sprockets depending on where the level of interest lives. Right. So in like the play to earn space right now, you know, extremely, um, extremely interesting to see, you know, the Splinterlands team and how everything that they've accomplished, they built their own blockchain essentially, um, or they used a dormant blockchain that, that customized it completely for their own usage and scaled it up and then have an entire kind of suite of IP where as a user, you don't even realize you're using blockchain. And right. I think that is a, a huge milestone moving forward is as a user for my customer persona, you know, do I really even need to understand the technology? The hope should be no, right? Like I don't even need to understand. The reality is blockchain and distributed ledgers are literally just databases, right? It's just taking data and binding it through encryption into a chain and then not making it, uh, making it, um, you know, uh, have, fungible, right? if you will. Yeah. So it's like, it's really, really interesting from that perspective where the technology already exists. Everyone's familiar with what a database is. It's just the way that it's constructed is slightly different. So when you're interacting with crypto, for example, in a, in a simple use case and kind of proof of concept perspective, gaming is great for that to test user interface, to test, you know, kind of game theory and different kind of graphic designs where the barrier to entry is low because you don't need to really know crypto um, yeah. and the like. Now, outside of obviously the gaming perspective, I think, you know, we have already spoke about some of the chain analysis and some of the more, um, you know, larger brands like Grayscale has done it and DCG has done a phenomenal job if you start looking at the asset manager space and same with Bitwise and Bitwise in the way that they're approaching this space is, is, is very, very respectful and admirable. Um, when you start looking at Coinbase and how they try to pioneer, you know, the regulatory regime, uh, it's been interesting to kind of see the defense, the, the defense tactics as anyone who has the dominant market share would take, right? Where it's kind of, we want to show the regulators that we are so much better than everyone else that the barrier to entry for anyone else is, is so great that it's insurmountable. And it's kind of domination through, in that instance, legal protection. Um, and I think, hey, it could be, it, it, that's kind of, it's an exciting approach to see. You're starting to see corp corporations take stances at this point. Some um, other exchanges that have different reputations in terms of their KYC and AML practices, their custody practices, their overall you know, um, brand association is not as, let's call it, credible as a Coinbase or a Gemini or a Genesis, right? Those types of um, firms are obviously very, very reputable and, and kind of taught after it's the it's the other end that is kind of being potentially pushed aside or pushed specifically into the decentralized route yeah. um so it's kind of that entire shift for me and watching the 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 entire space from that perspective is exciting and then you know it, you would be a fool to not be excited about some of the volatility within the the even um stable coin space yeah. whether it's this one that collapsed or not the concept of an algorithmic you know stable coin that is a, a pricing mechanism on behalf of global currencies is is notable and and very valuable you wouldn't have had the fed chair you know um or previous fed chair janet yellen at, talking specifically about stable coins and algorithmic currencies unless they thought it was a, a threat right to 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 the actual national security and on and you know the federal reserve and all where that goes into play um so while they're taking shots it's also kind of a a, a tip of the hat saying you know you guys from a retail perspective just built a 40 billion you know market cap project when you combine the two um you know, in terms of size, and it was organic, and you know, obviously fueled through venture, like everything else is in the in this space. Uh, but nonetheless, things are going to break, right? So I'm excited to see how this plays out because it's kind of stablecoin wars, and yeah. it's, it's stable coins are are like a core foundation of this crypto ecosystem. And so someone's going to be kind of the last man standing over time, I'd imagine. 
And I mean, maybe there is room for, you know, other market incumbents, but nonetheless, it's been, it's been a fun and uh, chaotic experience yeah, well, to navigate, I mean, you yeah, know? Without a doubt. I mean, and then you've also got the other, the other thing to think about where you've got like, you know, Gemini and Blockfly um, and companies like that that are offering just crazy APR on, you know, holding your stable coin and now it's depegged and who knows what's going to happen with all their rates and obviously Blockfly um, and Gemini are, are very structurally sound companies, but now they're going to be, I think, getting held to the fire a little bit just in terms of what they're going to do to their rates. Um, but yeah, yeah and not only that, but we're the other, you know, yield bearing platforms right, right. without necessarily pointing fingers at who is now most susceptible, they all had systemic risk in this, right? And yeah. like, it's, it, it was ever present. We know a lot of them personally and whatnot. And um, they're, they're all taking a hit and they're all looking at their internal balance sheet saying, do we need to raise capital? What is our liquidity? How, how are we positioned? Right. And so you're gonna see, in, and I think this is actually really relevant to kind of where we are in the market and, and as talent's flocking in, if you're if you're considering crypto like this is the, the the time where people should be looking at this as a crazy opportunity as a builder and saying this is this is a time to build right when everyone when all of the the distractions now have gone away all of the lambos being dropped off of hotels and conferences and stuff <laughs> for show like that's not happening right now yeah. and that's and that's when you want to start joining the teams because the people that are still around the people that are still developing and building, like those are the ones within three to four years from now or have actually made a difference, right? right? Um, and so those teams do exist and they're, they're very, you know, I would say liquid in perspective of talent moving from one team to the next as alliances are made and friendships born or all the above. But um, I'm, I'm just excited to see how it plays out. When, when you meet with those teams, what kind of questions are you, are you asking those founders to, to evaluate the builders, right? Like, what, how, are you, how are you evaluating these, these newer companies? Yeah, um, the early, so post-launch, it's a lot easier because you right. can start looking at historical development cycles and, and bugs and how you've responded to various critical issues and things of that nature. Pre-launch is obviously, you're, you're, you're kind of looking at historicals, you're looking at the team, you're looking at obviously the technical components, right? So I think the way that I, I go about vetting um, various opportunities within this space is, you know, first, first and foremost, from a high level, from a core tenants, do I agree with what this, um, with what this company is trying to accomplish, right? Now, that may be a perspective of like, hey, we, we want to do a lending market. And we know that lending is probably has market fit here because it's billions of dollars across the industry, right? But the yeah. reality is, is maybe you're going to do it on XYZ chain that no one's heard of. And so like, you know, you have to start thinking of, is this can holistically an opportunity that we think has life? You're almost acting as a venture investor if you're coming into a new early stage company, right? Because it's a highly concentrated bet on a singular organization. Um, you know, and so you start, start asking them about their experience that's relevant as you always do. But as you start going down through, you wanna start hearing some battle scars. But anyone who's been in crypto for any period of time that's reasonable, <laughs> a week. in the last 12 <laughs> months, yeah, I have battle scars and bruises, right? <laughs> they're, gonna have, they're gonna have the bumps and bruises that they can point back to and say, here was an issue and here's how I critically thought my way out of that. Um, and it's kind of the problem solving mindset, right? Is like what we're looking to identify and in, in seeing is how is this individual as a problem solver? And then of course, who are they surrounded with? It's you are who you surround yourself with, um, you know, both from a friend's perspective and from a professional perspective, personal and professional. Yeah. So like you, they, when you look at the top talent, you should see the whole team of folks that have done something impressive, right? Or, you know, and that's not to necessarily put a square peg in a round hole. We're seeing, just to be frank, 14-year-olds launch companies that have better development skills than 95% of the developers that you're going to, 98% of the developers that are, you're going to be sending your way. And the blockchain, 99.9%. These guys are 14. And they're, you know, raising millions of dollars just based off of code repositories that they've let right. out into the ether. And they're saying, hey, we built this tool, we thought it'd be useful. And then people are very excited about it, right? And so, I mean, they're, the age kind of, um, uh, I would say, 
I mean, there's there's a huge age uh, discrimination, if you will, because just because these kids are younger and you're seeing 18 year olds, you know, 20 year olds do the same thing um, doesn't mean that they're less experienced in terms of what they know, which may be in this instance, what I'm kind of most referring to are the engineering situations. Right. Um, of, of course, executive management on the C level that's kind of doing more business development or operations, legal, you know, that type of perspective is um is a, is a different conversation, I would say, but yeah. Well, I think I, I think that's con consistent across tech, right? Like the one thing that I've always liked about tech is that the younger people can, you know, become involved in our model, even here at Diversa, is we hire people really young and develop them internally. And I think that we see that with, with younger founders and and folks that you know, if you have a good product and if you have good technology, like you can you can go out and get the funding, but. But the core point of that and what's got me most excited about this space, even as we see the markets just like totally implode and the walls come crashing down, is I think like the core tenets of blockchain technology aren't going anywhere. Like whether the price right. does whatever it wants to do and it will, the core tenets of, of the technology are, are going to be around for, you know, for the foreseeable future. And so whether that means that Bitcoin becomes the digital standard for gold, I don't know. But I do know that blockchain technology is going to provide a ton of different opportunities and avenues for successful projects to develop. Um, I agree. Yeah, I completely agree. So I know we've got a bunch of questions here, uh, and I want to make sure that we get to them as well. Um, so Caleb, I see your question. Uh, if you're still on, it's it's storage. S T O R J. The pay to earn. Um, the uh, I'm sorry. The 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 P D E project that uh, they asked about basically. It's like an Airbnb for your data if you've got extra um, storage capability on your on your CPU that you can rent out or lease out. And I'm happy to, if you want to ping me on the side, you can talk through it. Um, why don't we start here with Paul's question? So, so uh, Warren, let me let me throw this one over to you. Um, so Paul asked, what would we not know about the size of institutional capital that will come in on the dip? And what does that mean for the notion of DeFi since the hedge funds may very well take control? No, that's a very good point. And that is, has been a strategic strategy, you know, in terms of controlling governance for various hedge funds so that they can, they can control the token economics and make it, you know, self-incentivized. So it, it's, it's very valid. Now, what I will say is, is there's a huge bucket of capital on the public side um, from anything that is uh, fully reporting in the investment banking world, any, whether or not the, um, mostly are all are public, but there is a huge, huge demand for funds that have mandates to be fully reporting and, you know, deploying into the crypto space. Um, you know, we're seeing pension funds and endowment funds come in and, and, and start asking the traditional asset managers, what's your crypto strategy? You know, and so a lot of those folks end up coming across the desk of, you know, folks like us, who are saying where do we where do we get access to deal flow? What are the custody services that we need? How do we set this up, you know, in order to do this internally? And then some of them decide, hey, we probably aren't fit to do this internally and have digital assets on our balance sheet, so they subcontract out through fund fund of funds and you know other asset managers, maybe like ourselves, right? Um, so th there's demand from the liquid perspective. There's demand from the underwriting and public perspective, and then I think the most headlines that we're seeing right now are in the venture space, right? We're seeing, you know, A16Z doing two, $3 billion funds. We're seeing FTX raising billions of dollars, right? Within three or four years, I think they raised that. Um, I, I don't know what their high was, but I want to say it was 60 or 32. I may be getting the rounds mixed up, but nonetheless, they've only around four years old, you know? Yeah. So like venture fuels that growth and they were hyper- profitable as well but nonetheless like that is how they start scaling subsidiaries and and all the above you start so i think you know there's going to be a huge emerging industry of kind of distressed projects projects that are right so not on the liquid side that's kind of on the let's call it market neutral arbitrage and lending fund like we are right the venture strategy we're seeing a, a bunch of uh interest just because people look at crypto and they say, we, we want to have a toe dipped in the sand and play cowboy too. So if we're going to dip our toe in the sand, instead of buying 1% of our balance sheet in Bitcoin, we're going to put 0.5% into these venture funds. And we're going to see, you know, if we can outperform. 
Um, you know, the other approach for is for like corporate treasuries is to start doing, you know, yield farming and these types of DeFi activities that we're seeing come in. I mean, before this Terra stablecoin launched, uh, excuse me, um, depegged, there's a custody provider called Fireblocks. We use them internally. Um, they're amazing, you know, great service provider in, in, in the industry. They recently launched access to this blockchain Terra. Uh, and um, within the first week, it was almost a billion dollars of institutional inflows. Now keep in mind, these are all institutional, you know, clients that are, that are working on these platforms. Within a week, a billion dollars kind of fled from traditional assets that were maybe, you know, in different strategies, but into, you know, this, this um, stable coin. And so, you know, the, the money flow is coming in. Uh, we're seeing retail flow out, right? Because when you look at the fear and greed index, when right. others are fearful, you know, typically retail is running and Wall Street is stepping in and picking up the pieces. And that's what we're seeing here right now. Um, is kind of a consortium of Wall Street parties. The first one was kind of the attacker, the malicious uh, actor in this event. And now we're trying, and now there's a whole community of, you know, heroes that are kind of stepping in and pledging billions of dollars of assets to retain this type of peg. And, you know, so it, we'll see if it's good versus evil who wins in, in, the, uh, in the long run, if you will. But um, yeah. It, I don't know how we got there, but <laughs> I'm rambling. <laughs> do you think it's a, do you think that this kind of shift in terms of the investment that we're seeing is a fundamental shift in VC strategy, or is it more a question of just increasing the allocation amounts? I would definitely, I'm saying that seeing personally that people are leaning into what's working and you know they're starting to see down rounds um so that people are better capitalized and you know people are willing in this in some instances to give up more tokens and equities for when so they can have more powder when you know the dust settles and the opportunity kind of comes back right and so i think the average check size is definitely getting significantly larger the average fund and fund raise is getting significantly larger before, if you were raising a 50 to $100 million venture fund, you were kind of, you know, a larger participant from anywhere between, I would say, 2018 to 2019 or 20, even 17, you're raising 50 to 100 million to deploy into crypto. You were a rather big fish. Now you're adding zeros behind that, right, per entity. Um, and so obviously the orders of magnitude have gone uh, significantly higher. And most of these funds all have a mandate to deploy over three years, right. right? And so three to five years. And so that capital that's just been raised in the last year or so is now when, you know, you would expect them to be actively deploying that, not when valuations are already extraordinarily frothy, unless you're an asset manager that's chasing, right? But yeah. um, nonetheless, like here, I think you're going to start seeing the venture funds lean into the assets that they do have uh, to deploy, and, and then start rate so that they can raise their subsequent round because I think they're going to start getting markups faster than they would historically. And so as a fund manager, right, you are incentivized to deploy as much early as you can to get faster markups so that they can obviously deploy their next fund. So yeah. it's that whole game, um, you know, that, that you're seeing. Okay. So we have another question from Pat Corcoran here, and he says that you touched on two distinct forms of investment in private crypto companies. Uh, would love your perspectives on the trend of how active larger at scale companies in the space um, are are operating in these startup deals like Coinbase and, and FTX and Consensus and Kraken. And, and I, I can quickly go there, Warren. And I think like we, we touched on this a little bit in terms of like corporate acceptance of the crypto space. And I think we're seeing that obviously with like Tesla and their approach into you know, Dogecoin and, and, uh, and Bitcoin and even with like MicroStrategy and Michael, Michael Saylor like literally taking out loans against the stock in order to buy more Bitcoin. Probably getting it's crushed bonds. in the hell. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's a net a good thing. Obviously, that may not have panned out well in the short term for, for MicroStrategy, even though I think it did help their earnings calls. Um, but I think as more and more, uh, as more and more corporate interests are or you know increase within the crypto space and more companies you know take steps to invest, it can only be a good thing. And I, I think that what we're going to see and this is kind of why I asked the fundamental shift question to you, Warren, on the VC stuff, is because I think a, a lot of companies like A16Z are trying to, you know, establish themselves as the forefront investors within VC. I don't think it's necessarily happened yet because there's 
there's only been, you know, a handful of like true, true winners. And so right. as these companies like Coinbase Ventures, you know, in life consensus go in and make these, these big bets, I think that that like that ecosystem will start to sort of develop itself. And then we'll start to see who the real winners are, not just from a company standpoint, but from an investor standpoint as well. And so who knows, like Coinbase Ventures may, may not be just an offshoot of Coinbase uh, in the next 10 years, right? It could, that may be a, you know, yeah. competitive asset manager, totally. you know, and I, I, I whole, whole, wholeheartedly agree because they, they're in control of the flywheel. And, right. you know, personally, I'm a, I'm a huge FTX guy, right? And so like FTX ventures, I'm just gonna use this as an example, because I think in terms of a KPI perspective, if you were to point to one party being on a track way of sustainable and, and, and more continued innovative success, I would point towards FTX. And their venture approach is, you know, the entire flywheel. They bring them in from an initial early stage. They're going to come in, they incubate them, they provide technology resources, they provide industry expertise, um, you know, and then from there, they, if you're like a specific NFT project, they have a listing platform where they're starting to do a whole bunch of listings and launches of NFTs, um, which is interesting to see. And then obviously from an exchange perspective, like they list them, uh, some of their assets very early on. Uh, the ones that they get into the venture deals. And that's kind of what you're seeing across Coinbase as well, is Coinbase will get into these deals, seed them very early, right. put them on the fast track to their listing, um, and, and then obviously realize a very large multiple on their investment once they bring them through that manufactured process. Um, I, I think that's going to come under scrutiny, certainly, because that's not sustainable. And we're already starting to see that where before, if you were listed on Coinbase, it was a 50, 60 percent, you know, sometimes hundreds of a percent jump in terms of that listing catalyst and announcement. Now, something that's listed on Coinbase, it's almost to sell the news events. The employees have almost front run the, the, the entire thing along the way so much that then that everyone in the world knows that this is going to get listed. And so it's like a sell the event when it, when yeah. the liquidity comes. And uh, that's, I don't think, the, the pathway forward. But I think the continual incubation, access to capital um, in, in from like a, the flywheel perspective is definitely where you're going to start seeing the largest asset managers, you know, uh, emerge. And then from there, you're going to start to see consolidation of traditional financial services companies, trust companies, custodians, right? Um, you start looking at money service providers, uh, anything with an MSB license, you know, those types of um, or money transmitter licenses, excuse me. Um, you know, those types of businesses are going to be acquired by crypto companies because they're going to, they're going to need those flex, that flexibility to operate within the industry. So um, it's going to go through the whole venture flywheel. Yeah, I, I think that the venture flywheel is the right way to put it. Um, so we have, I think, time for one more question here. I like this question. It's, it's a little bit more broad. Um, and so Nicole asked just basically kind of, you know, who we're following to keep up with the, the news, right? Like what Twitter, uh, what Twitter profiles, what podcasts, you know, where can, where can people absorb their information? And, and I, I mentioned, like, I think Twitter is the best way to kind of keep up with this because there's so much going on and it's happening so quickly. Um, but I like the Pomp podcast a lot. I really like uh, Chris Dixon uh, from A16Z and all the content that he puts out both on his blog um, and also uh, whether he's on, you know, um, a call in or whether he's doing his own podcast with it within a 16 Z. Um, but I think there's a guy uh, at red point, Tomas Tungu. He's a, I think he's a managing director there. And I think his perspective on this, he's not just like a, you know, a Bitcoin maximalist, right? Like he will give really well thought out opinions and responses to, um, you know, to issues and they'll look at both sides of it. And his blog, he posted on the red point page as well. Uh, I think is really, really strong. It also gives a ton of background information into where he's getting that information as well. So you can sort of use it as a good starting point um, to dovetail off. But, but I've found, I found those to be, aside from just kind of following the players in, you know, the venture space that are, are tweeting about crypto and then whatever else they're investing in. I think like those are kind of like my, my starting points. I don't know where, we're interested to hear where, uh, where you're, where you're, you know. Yeah. I would say you have, it's like a, it's a, fun game to try to funnel all of yeah, the noise right. in crypto into something palatable Centralize and, it. <laughs> and, and, and like and, and the digestible right there's so much information out there and i'd say like from a primary sources perspective if something's going awry 
then yeah, most firms are looking at uh, Twitter for right. like, you know, crisis management and communications of a hack or whatever it may be. Um, or, hey, we're doing a product launch and promo. The primary communication channels are from a public perspective going to be from like a Twitter. Um, but nonetheless, when you're looking at the collectives that are operating with amongst themselves, you're really starting to see a lot of the very technical crypto native group move, move into Discord and Telegram uh, servers, but not just, you know, it sounds kind of sleazy, but the real reason behind this is because they're doing it with um, a token permission access. So you either own a specific token or you own an NFT and that allows you to kind of come in and get access to this community. So it kind of reduces some of the noise from that perspective. Yeah. Um, but a as a whole, I would say like Twitter is a great way for, for kind of getting the barrage at you from the entire ecosystem. You're gonna find your rabbit hole that you go down. And then for me, the rabbit holes that we're going down are like, the medium pages and get books and development documentation as well. But, you know, just because it, you'll find something that's interesting and in, because it's not just a financial service product or a blockchain based gaming company, but it could be a, you know, transaction monitoring company that gets you excited and whatever gets you excited is what you should continually go down, um, yeah. you know, from that perspective. Well, we, uh, so we're at time, we are losing viewers like flies here. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to, uh, Obviously, send a huge thank you to you, Warren, and, and the team at Tech Meets Trader. Huge thank you uh, to the team at um, Hunt Scaling Media as well. And then huge, I guess, biggest thank you to uh, everyone who who came and um, you know posted questions and, and was here for for the ride. So um, you know, feel free to follow up with us afterwards. But uh, but Warren, it was great getting the chance to talk to you, and thanks for carving out the time, man. It was just, this is a uh, really fun. Likewise, Sean, I'm looking forward to grabbing some beers and, you know, yeah. thank you Diversa Partners and Hunt Scanlon for having us. I really appreciate the time and, you know, it was an honor to be uh, hosted with you guys today. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you soon, Warren, and uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.